Thank you, Brother God, to be back in God's house, to hear the beautiful word that we just heard. Amen. Bless and strengthen me, and I am sure for each one of you today, amen, you're here. I look at all this host of pastors and ministers, amen, majority that I believe I know, some that I haven't yet met, and I think what an elite group to be with here today. Amen. People that love truth. Amen. Love the Word of God. Embrace, hallelujah, the teachings of a New Testament church. And I'm just honored to be here. Amen. Honored to uh, have acquaintance and friendship with Brother Godwin. Amen. I've got an aunt of mine that when my uncle passed away, he was her pastor, the uncle was, and uh, the auntie knew enough to know that even a pastor's wife can't be their own pastor. Amen? And when pastor died, was off the scene, I am grateful that Brother Godwin, amen, became my aunt's pastor. I've got family members, and I'm sure all of you do. Amen. And it means so much to lovers of truth to know that our relatives are in good churches. Amen. Churches that preach truth and stand for it. Amen. And it just brings such a special blessing that uh, truthfully nothing else can quite bring like that. Amen. I ask you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Galatians chapter number 4. And also one verse out of the book of Lamentations, chapter number 4. Galatians, the fourth chapter. And then if you'll put a finger in your Bible there at Lamentations, chapter 4. I see so many men here that I would much rather hear preach than myself today. Amen. But it's, I guess, my lot and duty, so... You come preach for me sometime. Amen. Burbank needs a whole lot of this right here. Galatians chapter 4. And we'll begin reading at verse number 14, if you will. Galatians chapter 4. Verse number 14, Paul said, In my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth. Lamentations chapter 4 and verse number 16 said, The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priest. They favored not the elders. Read that again. The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priest. They favored not the elders. I would like to preach to you today as I feel impressed of the Lord simply on this subject, the message and the messenger. The message and the mess. Been convinced of late, the last few weeks, in studying this book, that there is an absolute connection between your attitude toward the message and your attitude toward the messenger. Amen. One cannot 
be way up high on the totem pole and the other way down at the bottom somewhere. Either or, they are definitely scripturally connected together. And I want to ask God to help me, amen, today to open some understanding unto us. Would you pray with me, mighty God? Thank you for your blessings, Lord. Thank you for the wonderful Spirit of God. Thank you for the liberty that's in this meeting, God. Thank you, Lord, oh God, for Holy Ghost freedom that is here, Lord. And the thought that I have today, O oh Lord, will only be alive if you breathe life into it, God. Will only be a blessing, God, if you come and bless it, Lord. And I pray for you to do that today, God. I'm asking you, Lord God, in the great name of Jesus Christ, oh, mighty God, let your spirit, let your presence, oh, God, let it come, Savior, let it come, God, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. There it is. Usually works when you stop pushing buttons. Amen. The message and the messenger. The Apostle Paul was in a Mamertine prison in Rome awaiting the executioner that was going to come and end his life. Knew and understood that his days were numbered and as the righteous man of God that he was. He had a burden and a concern for all the people that he had led, that he had pastored, that he had striven to try to get them on the right road and get them away from all of the false doctrines and teachings and philosophies that the world of their time had pumped inside of them. And he carefully and painfully knew that his life had been an example of teaching and preaching and showing to them and convincing them through skillfully using the Word of God that there's only one way, hallelujah, that there's only one message, praise God, that there's only one highway of truth and pathway of righteousness for them to happen to walk upon. And now he reflected on a church that he had founded and built and pastored there in the city of Galatia. And he was a broken-hearted pastor that reflected upon a spell of witchcraft. So it seemed like that had come upon the Galatian people that was there. And that had created within them now a variance. And they no longer were walking in the truth and the light that had been presented unto them. And with a burdened heart, Paul began to try to write and give some instructions back to them. I hope you realize, I do understand, that the things that the Galatian church were dealing with there are in some respects different than what we deal with today. But the basic core principle is exactly the same and has remained the same. The Judaizers had come and tried to cause them to go back under the law and not walk in the light that had been expressed unto them. And the Apostle Paul was fighting hard over the principle that said, once you have seen light, you've got to walk in that light. You can't turn around. You can't let anybody influence you. You can't let those that may have held that position of influence in your life in the past uh, convince you to back up one little bit. And so Paul wrote to them 
from that premise. And Paul, throughout the book, you can take a gander through it, if you please, and you will find that the Apostle Paul is interweaving together, trying to get them to cross the bridge with him. He's talking about the message and the solidity of the message uh, and how important and how immutable that that message is that was preached unto them. Uh, but then it's like he has to interweave in between all of that uh, and give his qualifications and vindication for his apostleship and for he because he understood that if I as the messenger don't have any credibility in the minds and the concepts of these people. It will undermine the very words uh, that I want to speak unto them. Uh, and the Apostle Paul asked them uh, a lot of questions concerning that. Uh, he said, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Uh, for if I I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Uh, he said, but I certify you, brethren, uh, that the gospel which was preached of me uh, is not of man. I, I, I want to tell you something, guys. Uh, this message that was preached, uh, you got to keep on believing this message. Hallelujah. He said that, that there's no give in it at all. Uh, he said, oh yeah, I, I've got to go back. And folly, he called it one other place. Uh, and I've got to list my credentials again uh, to try to get your respect level for the messenger back up on the level where you think you're holding the message at today. Uh, he said, uh, let me tell you, I'll give you my experience. Uh, he said, God revealed some things, uh, revealed His Son in me, uh, and I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles uh, before me. But after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. He said, now I'm writing to you some things. And I'm telling you before God, I lie not. Isn't it a terrible thing that it could ever slip to the place that their very own pastor had to verbally tell him, hey, quit thinking I'm lying to you. Uh-huh. Isn't that terrible that he'd have to even spend the time uh, on verses like that? But let me tell you, friend, uh, when you start getting question marks in your mind uh, toward the message, you will also at the same time uh, have developed question marks uh, toward the messenger. And the reverse of that is also true. Uh, I have seen plenty of good God-fearing Pentecostal believers uh, that said, I, I don't have a problem with the message. I'm just having a little problem with my pastor. You're deceived, my friend. You're terribly and miserably deceived. When you got a problem with one, you mark it down. You're going to have a problem with the other. The two of them are connected together. And Paul said, I, I, I know, I know my face was unknown uh, to the churches in Judea. He said, I went to James and Cephas and John uh, that seemed to be pillars that was there. And guess what? So you'll add some credibility to my ministry. He said, I, I hate to tell you this, uh, but at Jerusalem there, I did receive receive the right hand of fellowship. Uh-huh. In, in case you, you, you don't think, uh, amen, you, you think I just was some uh, whodunit that blew in out of nowhere. He said, you know, I did receive the right hand of fellowship there and was accepted by them. Uh, but 
Paul said, let me tell you. He said, if I build again the things that I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. He said, here I am as the messenger. And because of the erosion of your attitude and your feeling toward me, the whole house of cards is fixing to come down in your life. He said, I want you to know that though we are an angel from heaven come preaching any other gospel to you, amen, than what you've already heard, let him be a curse. And he repeated it all over again in the next verse of that chapter. He said, I'm telling you, this message cannot change. But the reason why the message is changing in your mind and in your families is your attitude toward the messenger has gone south. He said there was a time, a time that you Galatians would have plucked out your eyeballs. Back when you were tender and ripe and open for new light and revelation for the gospel that I had to preach to you. Your soil was so conditioned that you viewed me, me, the fella that you're looking at is your enemy. There was a day that you viewed me like I was Jesus Christ in the flesh. You viewed me like I was some angelic being uh, the day I walked into your coast uh, and I preached to you the gospel and you saw an explosion of truth uh, that you had never seen before. Uh, he said you were open to it. The message was way up here and I was way up there in your thoughts, in your feelings, uh, and in your attitudes. Uh, but he said now. I, I, I'm worried about it uh, because you have returned uh, unto the beggarly elements uh, whereunto you desire a damn to be in bondage. Uh, he said you've returned back to that. Uh, and the reason why you have gone back to those things uh, is your attitude has soured toward me as the messenger and my love uh, and embrace for you. He said, there was a time that you called me blessed. The Greek word for blessed there is a word, if you'll study it out, it's about the joy and the happiness experienced only by the dead. <laughs> he said, there was a time that you viewed me like something bigger than life. There was a time that you put me in the focus of your mind, of sainthood, of them that have already gone on to the grave. Your attitude and your concept toward me, hallelujah, was something uh, that was attributed. Matter of fact, in Greek writings, uh, it is the quality that was attributed unto God's. Hallelujah. That's how you viewed me, how you looked at me. Uh, he said, when I first came to you, uh, you had this concept and attitude uh, of the messenger. And oh my, you have felt like that now you could nitpick on me the things that you didn't quite like uh, and that it would not affect uh, your feelings and your core beliefs uh, about this message. But they're both going down the tubes together, Paul said. They're both being effective at the same time. He said, I want to tell you something. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Is this guy that was so holy uh -huh, that you just feared to walk in his office with him? 
because you felt so much of the Shekinah glory of God upon me. Did I become your enemy all of a sudden just because I keep on telling you the truth? And I won't change on the message. Now, let me tell you something. You don't want a lying preacher. <laughs> you don't want a lying preacher. <laughs> You don't want anything to do with a fellow that won't tell even when the truth is painful. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There are certain diseases that are prevalent, I'm sure, in families. And just happens in my family that many of my family members have died of cancer. And, and I, I'll tell you what, when I go to a doctor for a physical, I, I don't want a lying doctor. I don't want a fella that hadn't got the courage to look me in the eyeball and say, I'm sorry, but uh, something in the blood count isn't just exactly right. Uh, I, I don't want a guy, a man, that just passes over a swollen lymph node uh, and said, well, it just not, probably isn't nothing at all. Uh, and I don't want to disturb you. don't want to make you upset. Uh, I don't want to ruin your day. My friend, uh, I want a doctor that will look at me uh, and tell me the truth. Uh, if there is something terminal, uh, no matter how small that it is, uh, that's at work in my human body, uh, I want a doctor that will say, there it is, Bubba. It's right there and it's growing. You better get after it. Uh, you better do something uh, if you hope to live uh, a little bit longer. Hey, man. Uh, let me tell you, friend, uh, you don't want a lying preacher. Uh, you don't want somebody uh, that'll tell you uh, the things you want to hear because he don't want to become your enemy. Uh, you need a man of God. Uh, hallelujah. And said, like it or not, uh, amen, this messenger is going to preach the message uh, unto you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Now, a lying mechanic can make you feel good for a little while, can he? Can he? Who was it said of our current president? Said he's one of the handful of men in America that can make you feel good for 60 seconds. <laughs> I ain't interested in anybody. That can just make you feel good for 60 seconds. Hey Amen. You, you pull that car with that transmission slipping inside his garage. You've already got it figured out in your mind. Somebody told you, hey Amen, that it's going to be $1,800 to get a new transmission and you pull it inside of his shop uh, and get it in there and he looks at you with a great big old smile and he tells you oh uh, he said man this is your lucky day uh, he said, I'm telling you, you just thought it was an $1,800 bill. Uh, we, we, we got it all fixed for just $500. Uh, it, there, there really wasn't much to it, uh, but we had to do a little things, and we adjusted it. Uh, and what he means is, you know, they poured some of that stop leak inside uh, of the transmission. Uh, maybe a little sawdust, you know, so it it hang together a little better. Uh, hey Amen. And you go driving out. I'm telling you, you feel good, don't you? <laughs> 500 bucks, thank you, Lord. Uh, here I go down the street, man. Uh, think of all that money I saved. Uh, amen. Till you see that first drop of transmission fluid five days later on your driveway. Uh-huh. Your feelings and your attitude toward Him uh, starts changing pretty quick, doesn't it? Uh-huh. So you're going down the road and it slips out of gear again. Uh, you ain't going to send him a thank you card at that point. Uh, amen. Uh, something rises up on the inside. Uh, that said, Mr. Mechanic, uh, amen, I wish you hadn't lied to me. Uh, I, 
I'm telling you, all those things are bad and we all get burnt. Uh, but let me tell you, nothing worse uh, than a lying preacher. Hey, Amen. Uh, nothing worse than a lying preacher. That because of your money, because of your tithe, uh, because of your influence, uh, because of the size of your family uh, in the local assembly, uh, he ain't got the guts uh, to face you nose to nose uh, and preach the gospel uh, that is unchangeable uh, and tell you it ain't gonna work, buddy. You gotta repent. Uh, you gotta make it right. Yeah, man. Hallelujah. The Bible said the lip of truth shall be established forever. But a lying tongue is but for a moment. We've got a lot of those among oneness Pentecost today. My God, help us all. Amen. A lot of them lying preachers uh, that'll tell folks uh, what they want to hear. Well, I, I don't really see anything wrong with that. Uh, amen. Let me tell you, somebody's got to tell the truth. Uh, amen. And your attitude uh, toward that messenger, a man of integrity that doesn't become your enemy because he tells you the truth, uh, will affect forever, forever, hear me, uh, your attitude uh, toward this Acts 2.38 message, uh, toward the message of separation uh, and holiness uh, and living godly uh, in Christ Jesus. We are living in an age of perversion. And Paul talked about it. He said, when I lost your ear... You started tuning up your hearing aids to other voices of other preachers, of other churches that did it different, of other places. He said, you started queuing in uh, to those. And what happened is some of those voices you're listening to now are taking and perverting the gospel. They're perverting that gospel. But that's what you want to hear. This age of perversion. Uh, we're, we're living in the midst of it. Uh, homosexuality. The sexual perversion uh, of our society. Amen. Today that we live in. I received a call from North Carolina. Amen. Telling me that down in West Hollywood, there was a man there dying of AIDS that had been a part of a United Pentecostal church, uh, and I, I, I knew him just by name recognition when the message came, and I thought, oh, isn't this, isn't this ironic? I'm going to go down and visit with him, and I got ready to go there and realize, too, and where this man had come from, uh, a church built by one of our great pioneers uh, that stood for the one God. God message uh, that stood for truth and preached it uh, and lived it uh, and one of still one of our largest oneness churches uh, in California today. Uh, amen. And oh, uh, I, I began to think about it. I remember when that man was the choir leader of that church. And now I'm driving to West Hollywood. Amen. They say the population percentage of West Hollywood is over 90% percent homosexual of all of the residents that are there. I've been there in the hospices uh, from calls across the country to see and visit those uh, in the last stages of AIDS as they are dying there. And I walked inside that apartment room and there he came out. His mother was sitting there and he came out to talk. Weak, tattered body. Emaciated, just just looked like a matter of a few weeks and he'd be gone. Uh, and he came finally and tried to sit up at the table and couldn't keep his balance. Uh, and I looked at him and began to talk. I began to tell him the stories uh, of his old pastor, of the old church, uh, of all of the things. We began to talk about it uh, and his faith.
face would lighten up, he would smile. He'd say, oh, I wish I could sing in that choir again. I wish I could be back there enjoying that again. In the course of the conversation, his mother made mention of the fact that his father had passed away earlier. And I, just trying to be polite, I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your dad passing. And I mean like instantly, those eyes began to shoot fire. And and his whole visage uh, was, was changed and he looked uh, back at me. Uh, he said, I'm not one bit sad about it. I said, well, I, I, I'm sorry. He said, I'm thrilled that my dad is dead. He said, I hated the man. I hated that man. I said, well, uh, I'm sorry about that. He said, my dad would correct me when I was a child. And I hated it. And I hate him for the correction that he gave to me. I'm thrilled that he's dead. I wished I'd never known the man. I walked out of that apartment that day, and I remembered what the statistics have borne over and over again, that the only safeguard against homosexuality that's been proven is a good relationship with that man's father. And the day he allowed distance to come between that relationship was the day that physical perversion got its first, first foot inside of the door. Can I preach to you today and tell you that the first day, the first day that you hold your pastor at a distance, the first day that you let something build up on the inside because he corrected you, because he disciplined your little darling, uh -huh. because he had the nerve uh, to fence your boy out of the choir. Uh-huh. Because he lets you to know uh, you can't be a member of this church uh, if you're going to keep on doing those things. Uh, the very first day uh, that you started distancing uh, and holding him at arm's length uh, was the time uh, that spiritual perversion uh, has its opportunity uh, to put its foot inside the door uh, and say, do it some more. Give me a another chance, uh, and I'll come in further. Uh, I'll inch my way in uh, until I have you so messed up, uh, your mind so twisted, uh, amen, so confused, uh, you won't believe any part uh, of this one God message before long. Uh, you won't embrace uh, what you've been taught uh, from multiple generations. Uh, hear me, hear me, hear me. Spiritual perversion, uh, begins uh, with a bad relationship with your spiritual father. Amen. Amen. God said, I'm, I'm your father. Isaiah 64 and 8. He said, and the role of a father is to take you as a lump of clay mold and put pressure on you and fashion you and shape you, hallelujah, like I desire to do. 
But many, many have made the mistake of even the great patriarch of old named David. But the Bible tells us that he had a son by the name of Adonijah. I don't fully understand, but he, Adonijah, and his brother just older than him, Absalom, when the Scripture talks about him, it's always bragging on their good looks. It's always bragging on their physical character. Characteristics. Uh, I mean, they, they really must have been uh, hunks of boys. Uh, they really must have been uh, like they stepped out of GQ magazine, I guess. Uh, because it's just phenomenal uh, how sharp looking these two boys were. Uh, but even David, uh, with his knowledge and understanding, uh, the Bible reveals he made a terrible uh, mistake with Adonijah instead of being a father to him. Uh, and molding him and shaping him. The Bible said that he never displeased him by calling him on the carpet and saying, Why did you do this, son? Why did you do that? And the Hebrew word for displeased there, it means to carve or to shape that boy in plain oaky vernacular. David was so carried away with his cute little dimples. Uh, hey man, and how handsome uh, the boy looked. Uh, but he never whittled him down to size. Uh, he never carved on that boy. Uh, he never got it out uh, and said, you come here. You stand beside me. Uh, you're going to answer for your actions. Uh, I ain't just going to ignore that. Uh, why did you do that, son? Uh, I ain't going to let you buy with that kind of stuff anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you got a stinking little limp-wristed pastor that's afraid to whittle you down to size, uh, hey man, uh, you ain't got much. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't care how valuable you are to the music ministry of your local assembly. Hey, I ain't preaching theory. I just set every last one of my musicians down at the same time. We sang a cappella. We had a move of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I'm telling you, if you got a man of God that's got the courage, amen, to look at Elijah in the eyeballs and say, quit batting them pretty little eyelashes at me, fella. Quit trying to charm me with your grin and your dimples and your smile. Amen. You're looking at daddy. Mm-hmm. You're looking at daddy right now. Mama might ooh and ah about what a handsome guy you are. Uh, amen. And the ladies might swoon uh, and carry on uh, about how talented uh, and get weak need when you walk by. Uh, but daddy ain't impressed uh, with any of that garbage. Uh, my role uh, as your daddy uh, is to shape you uh, and to carve on you uh, and to work on you. Uh, and to whittle you down to size. You're going to get displeased. You ain't going to like it. You're going to get mad. You're going to swell up and pout. But you'll get over it. i got to save you, boy. Ooh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sunday afternoon, walking through the church, I saw this teenage boy. Man, he's about six foot four or five years old. I mean, feet high. About 16 years old, I guess he is. And boy, he really thinks he's, he's Casanova. Yeah. Before he came in the church, he had his pick of any of the girls in the school. So now that he's in the church, he thinks he can play the field, 
play with all the hearts of all the girls in the church. Carry on and flirt with them and all of that nonsense. Yeah, yeah, you know, you've got them in your church too. Uh huh. Hey man, I got wind of some of it. I thought, I ain't doing this boy a bit of good by ignoring that. Your pastor don't really love you if he ignores the times that you need to be whittled on. He don't really love you. He loves your tithe. Yeah, yeah. He loves your presence at church, uh, but He don't really love you. Uh, amen. Uh, hallelujah. And I looked at him. Uh, I said, hey, hey, Calvin, let's go right now. He said, where are we going? I said, down to my office. Uh-huh. We got in the office. Uh, amen. I just pulled my chair up right close to him so we could be eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose. Uh, and I said, Calvin, I'm talking to you right now. You ain't got a daddy. You ain't never had a daddy. Uh-huh. And that's the truth. Raised by mama. Amen. I said, you ain't never had anybody probably talk to you like I'm fixing to talk to you. I said, but I'm fixing to tell you something. Huh? And you just better sit down and take it uh, and accept it. Uh, I said, we ain't going to have none of that nonsense uh, going on around God's house here. Amen. I said, Calvin, I don't care what you did out in the world. Uh, all of that stuff is not important. Uh, when you come to this church, uh, you're going to stop that play in the field. Uh, you're going to stop messing with girls' hearts. Uh, you're going to stop all that flirting around. Uh, you ain't going to do it. You want to date? There's dating guidelines. Uh, and you're going to follow them. Uh, he's, he, he's just turning every shade. Uh, hey man, a white and wilting uh, and sitting down in the chair, eyes bugged out. Uh, he said, man, uh, well, okay, pastor. Uh, I said, I ain't let my own boys by with that nonsense. Uh, what gave you the idea I was ever going to let you buy with it? We ain't going to do that at Victory Tabernacle. You got that, Calvin? We're going to be godly. We're going to do it right in the Word of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hey Amen. Hey Amen. I read to you from the book of Lamentations, the terrible lament, and I closed with it. Jeremiah weeping and crying. He said, it's terrible how God finally had to get angry with His people. Because something happened in their attitude toward the messengers. Something went terribly wrong. He said, and God got flat angry about it because they respected not the persons of the priest. I have a little saying around my church at home that I repeat often to the teenagers. I tell them the real test of how much God you've got is when your will and my will meets head on. The real test. It ain't how many laps you ran around the church. It's not how dynamic the youth choir was. <clears throat> but it's when your will and my will meets head on. Because God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and said, not only did you not respect the persons of the priest, but you didn't bend to the elders. When there was head-ons that happened, you weren't the one that bent over in submission. You weren't the one that allowed your will to be broken and a confidence in your heart to be had toward the man of God. And the Bible said, it's terrible, read that whole chapter. But he said, the end results of those that won't bend to the elders 
is that they that were brought up in scarlet embrace Not a more graphic word picture than that a prissy nice feminine lady all decked out in her beautiful frillies is now walking in all the silk and satin and she's hugging up to a pile of manure and she's embracing it that's what physical perversion is and that's what spiritual perversion is those that are brought up on these pews hear this choir and singing and preaching brought up so beautifully so delicately by God one day because an attitude that wasn't right toward the messenger finally destroys their attitude toward the message. Amen. Amen. As the musicians come, I feel so impressed of the Lord here as I conclude that there are some people here that I've preached to that it would be incredibly painful for you to admit it in front of this congregation of people but there has been something that has come up in your heart that's put a little bit of distance between you and your pastor Maybe you've never told anybody about it. Maybe you've never thought that it would ever affect anything at all. Probably thought you'd be one God Jesus name apostolic till the day you die, regardless of the feelings that were there and the attitudes. But that there are people here today, one day hear me, one day you will walk away from this message if you don't get your attitude toward the messenger taken care of. One day it will happen in your life. Shall we stand together? Hallelujah. Let's pray for a moment. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please, in the fear of the Lord. Please, nobody looking around. I'm going to ask for somebody just honest enough. Honest enough to be real today. No, you haven't. <clears throat> you haven't yet been gossiping about your pastor. You haven't been sowing seeds of discord. You haven't been getting up a petition to throw him out of town. But inside of your heart of hearts, you know that you are not as close. You're not as close to your shepherd as what you need to be. And you'd be honest enough to admit that. Would you just slip your hand up right now? I'm not as close to my shepherd. Hands all over this building. I'm not as close as I need to be. 
And I never realized how dangerous spiritual perversion was of the message. Amen. Amen. I'd like to ask everybody in this building, you don't know who lifted their hands or who didn't, but I'd like to ask you to reach out right now and pray with the person beside you. And pray this prayer, O oh God. <laughs> Protect us from spiritual perversion. And let us snuggle up tight and get a close, healthy relationship between us and the messenger that you have sent to bring the gospel to my family. Pray with them right now. Pray with them. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God, help us. Help us, God, if we're going to love this message. We're going to pass it on to the next generation. we got to stay close to the messenger. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord, lead us in a song, sister. Amen. Come on, somebody beside you really, really needs it. There were several hands lifted in this building. They're honest about it. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable. The devil's after them. Oh. 